this model, we're going to cover sections 12.6 and 12.8 from the book Introductory Chemistry, <clears throat> Liquid Solids and Intermolecular Forces. By the end of this model, you will be able to determine the types of intermolecular forces in a compound. So there are different types of intermolecular forces, dispersion, dipole-dipole, and hydrogen bonding. The strength of the intermolecular forces between the molecules or atoms that compose a substance determines the state, solid, liquid, or gas, of the substance at room temperature. Strong intermolecular forces tend to result in liquids and solid, with high melting and boiling points. Weak intermolecular forces tend to result in gases, with low melting points and boiling points. Here we focus on three fundamental types of intermolecular forces. In order of increasing strength, they are the dispersion force, the dipole-dipole force, and the hydrogen bond. So let's start by talking about the dispersion forces. The default intermolecular force present in all molecules and atom is the dispersion forces. So at least if you have just one intermolecular force, it's going to be the dispersion force. But this is the one that all molecule has. Dispersion forces are caused by fluctuations in the electron distribution within molecules or atoms. Since all atoms and molecules have electrons, they all have dispersion forces. The electrons in an atom or molecule made at any one instant be unevenly distributed. And that will induce the instantaneous dipoles. Random fluctuations in the electron distribution of a helium atom cause in instantaneous dipoles to form. So here, let's see that we can have like a movie of <clears throat> an atom of helium. In the frame number one, we can see the nucleus in the middle and the two electrons around the nucleus. In frame number two, we can see a distribution of electrons just like this. And in frame number three, we can see that those two electrons are close together in the same region. So that will induce a dipole. Both electrons in the same region will induce a, a delta po negative, a partial negative charge, and in the other side will be a partial positive side. So due to the movement of those electrons, they remember that the electrons are moving random in an atom, they at some point could be all in the same region causing this instantaneous dipole. Okay, so we can have both of them in the same side inducing a uh, partial charge of minus one, while in the other side will be a uh, a uh, partial uh, charge of positive one. So the nature of dispersion forces was first recognized by Fritz London, a German-American physicist. This fleeting charge separation is called an inst instantaneous dipole or temporary dipole. <clears throat> an instantaneous dipole on one helium atom induces an instantaneous dipole on its neighboring atoms because the positive end of the instantaneous dipole attracts electrons in the neighboring atoms. The dispersion force occurs as neighboring atoms attract one another. The positive end of one instantaneous dipole attracts the negative end of another one. The dipoles responsibly for the dispersion force are transient, constantly appearing and disappearing in response to fluctuation in the electron cloud. So basically what we were saying is that this one maybe has that dispersion uh, force where we induce uh, a negative one here and then a positive here. And this positive uh, end will attract the electron of another neighboring helium. So both of them will be in this side inducing that in the other side will be a positive, uh, partial positive charge that will also induce to another um, helium atom, both electrons to be close to it, okay, to induce that uh, partial negative charge and then at the other side will be a positive, partial positive charge. But this interaction are really weak interaction, but they are, you can find them in this type of uh, atoms that can induce those dispersion. So an instantaneous dipole on any helium atom induces instantaneous dipoles on the neighboring atoms. The neighboring atoms then attract an, one another. This attraction is called the dispersion force. And also, I mentioned before about the electron cloud, that's when we have a high concentration or presence of electrons. So we have here an, a small electron cloud, as also here, a small electron cloud, okay? So that's 
why we are uh, meaning about with the electron clouds. So the dispersion forces, the magnitude of the dispersion forces depend on how easily the electrons in the atoms or molecule can polarize in response to an instantaneous dipole, which depend on the size of the electron cloud. To polarize means to form a dipole moment. A larger electron cl cloud results in a greater dispersion force because the electrons are held less tightly by the nucleus and therefore can polarize more easily. While molar masses can alone does not determine the magnitude of the dispersion force, it can be used as a guide when comparing dispersion forces within a family of similar elements or compounds. And we can see that in this table, we are looking here just to the noble gas family. And because of that, we can use the molar mass as a guide to see what effect will that uh, dispersion cloud will induce. As higher the molar mass, we can see that the boiling point is higher. Remember that the boiling point is the temperature where the liquid transforms to gas. And you need to, broke, to break those interactions in the liquid to produce the gas. So that's why, because you have, are having a higher molar mass, you're ha having a higher electron cloud, so the, disp the, the dispersion force is going to be higher for those with higher molar mass. So that's why you need to apply more uh, heat or a higher temperature to make that, for example, in this case, the xenon, to make them from liquid to gas. Okay, so that's why we, are we can use the molar mass as a guide, but remember that this will be just when we are comparing, for example, atoms of the same family or compounds that they are related between them. Okay, so that's the only way that we can use the molar mass as a guide to induce, to, to, to cor correlate that as, as higher the molar mass, the higher is going to be the dispersion forces, and that will be reflected in, for example, a physical um, uh, determination of, for example, a boiling point, okay, so a physical property. So as higher the molar mass, higher the boiling point for this uh, family of the noble gas elements. The other uh, intermolecular force is the dipole-dipole force. The dipole-dipole force exists in all polar molecules. Remember, when we have polar molecules, we have dipoles. We have a, 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 um, a positive end and a negative end. Okay, so that's this dipole-dipole force will be present in all molecule uh, polar molecules. Polar molecules have permanent dipoles. Okay, as that's, that's the one that we saw before. That were they were induced okay just for a moment this one are permanent that interact with the permanent dipole of the neighboring molecule the positive end of one permanent dipole is attracted to the negative end of another this attraction is the dipole dipole force remember that all molecules including polar ones have dispersion forces in addition polar molecules have dipole dipole forces so uh, the polar mo molecule could have, they will always have the dispersion forces, but also they will have dipole-dipole forces. These additional attractive forces raise their melting and boiling points relative to the non-polar molecule of similar molar mass. So in this case, because the dipole-dipole the force is, is, um, is, is gr uh, greater than the one of the dispersion forces, the physical properties, as for example, boiling point or melting point, they're going to be higher okay, than those of nonpolar molecules with similar molar mass. So here we have, for example, we're going to show you uh, uh, what is a, a permanent dipole in a molecule that is this one, form form formaldehyde. Uh, formaldehydes are polar and therefore have a permanent dipole. Where can you see the, the polar uh, bond here, for example? Carbon and hydrogen. This polar is, I mean, this bond is a non-polar non covalent bond, as well as this one, okay? So this hydrogen uh, carbon, this bond is a non-polar covalent bond. But this one is a polar covalent bond because oxygen has a higher electronegativity than carbon. Between this and this, the difference is, is, is smaller than 0.4, making this bond a non-polar. But the difference of, of electronegativity between oxygen and carbon this is larger than 
So that means that this is a polar bond and we can draw the arrow, okay, uh, uh, pointing to the oxygen. We're going to have the arrowhead in this part and the positive tail in the carbon. So it can be represented also like this. We have the hi hydrogen, hydrogen, carbon, oxygen. This is the partial negative, partial positive. Here we have the permanent dipole. And by saying that, when we have one molecule of formaldehyde with a positive, uh, partial positive end and a negative uh, partial negative and here this partial positive will attract the negative partial positive uh, par uh, the partial negative end of another formaldehyde creating this interaction that is known as dipole dipole okay this is a dipole dipole interaction where we have permanent dipole in the molecule so here we're going to have this is a uh, where we, when we compare compounds with basically the same molar mass okay but the formaldehyde uh, and eth ethane, we can see the structure. We can see here that this one has a polar bond and also the molecule is polar, while this one is a non-polar compound because all of the uh, bonds that we have here are non-polar covalent bonds. Okay, so let's see what, what, what will be the difference be because of the presence of this polar bond or this polar molecule as compared with this. For example, in the boiling point, this uh, physical property. And as we can see here, the boiling point for formaldehyde is higher than the one for ethane, basically by 60 degrees. And the melting point as well is around 80 degrees, the difference between them. And this is because the presence of this dipole that will induce a dipole-dipole uh, interaction between the molecule. Intermolecular uh, inter attraction will be the dipole-dipole for formaldehyde. So this interaction is stronger than the uh, dipole induced that we will have in every molecule. Ethane, for example, will have just dispersion forces. Formaldehyde will have dispersion forces and also dipole-dipole. Okay, so that's why because of the presence of this dipole, that will uh, induce or we pro uh, will produce uh, a change or a higher difference in the physical properties as the boiling point and also the melting point as we can see here in this table. So let's talk now, now. Let's talk now about the miscibility, that is the liquid's ability to mix with another liquid without separating into two phases. So miscibility is when you combine two liquids and you don't see the difference between that mix. So in general, polar liquids are miscible with other polar liquids, but are not miscible with non-polar liquids. For example, water, a polar liquid, is not miscible with pentane a nonpolar liquid. Similarly, water and oil do not mix. Consequently, oily hands or oily stains on clothes cannot be washed away with plain water. Here we have, for example, the uh, pentane, that is this one in the top, and water. And pentane is a nonpolar compound. It doesn't have any, the, the only one is dispersion force, the, 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 the intermolecular uh, force that they have is the dispersion force, while water has dispersion but also has the polar, um, I mean the dipole-dipole, okay? And also we're going to see a little bit later that they also have another one that is called hydrogen bond. But for now, we can say that because water is polar and pentane is non-polar, they are not miscible between them. Also here we have, for example, oil and vinegar. Oil is non-polar while vinegar is polar, so that's why also they can mix them, they are not miscible. And here we have an oil spill from a tanker that demonstrates that petroleum and seawater are not miscible. Seawater, we have water there, so we expected that water is polar, while the petroleum is not polar, so that's why they can't mix. They are not miscible. A molecule has dipole-dipole forces if it is polar. To determine whether, the, whether a molecule is polar, you must determine whether the molecule contains polar bonds and second, determine whether the polar bonds are at together to form a net dipole moment. Remember that we mentioned before in chapter 10 that uh, the presence of a polar bond, bond uh, it is not the only thing that you need to have to make the molecule also polar because of the uh, three-dimensional structure of the molecule. 
if those polar bonds can be added together, they can form that net dipole moment. But sometimes, because of the geometry of the molecule, those dipoles will cancel between them. Those polar bonds will cancel between them. And even though you have polar bonds in the molecule, the molecule will be nonpolar, as for example, CO2. So, also, you need to check the electronegative difference to determine the bond polarity. As here, we have the CO2 example that I mentioned. We have carbon, oxygen, carbon, oxygen. The difference between them is pretty high, but it's basically 1.0 that, that make this bond polar and also this bond polar, but they cancel between them because the geometry is linear. So even though you're going from this point to this one and this point is going to this one, they're going in different ways, okay, opposite ways. So they cancel between them. Here we have a molecule that has a tetrahedral structure, okay, but in this case we have that this bonds has a higher difference in electronegativity than this one, okay, so that's why the net polar uh, uh, vector is going to be this way, so this one is polar, okay, even though they look like they go to opposite side, but this one has, has a larger uh polarity on this one, so that makes this molecule polar going the net dipole to this side. Now in methane, oops, sorry about that, methane, that we have all of them are with the same uh, polarity, so they will be, can we cancel them because they are going on opposite sides and all of them has basically the same uh, polarity, so that's why in this case the methane is nonpolar, while in this one is polar because of the difference of polarity between this bond and this bond. This has a higher polarity than this one. So now let's talk about the hydrogen bond that I mentioned before when I was talking about the example of the pentane and the water. Polar molecules containing hydrogen atoms bonded directly to fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen exhibit an additional intermolecular force called a hydrogen bond. HF and H3 and water all undergo hydrogen bonding. Okay, so that means that HF and H3 and H2O they have dispersion forces because every molecule will have dispersion forces. They will have dipole dipole. Okay, they have dipole dipole because remember that the, the bond between hydrogen and nitrogen is a is a polar bond, as well as oxygen and hydrogen and hydrogen and fluorine. All of them will have dipole dipole interaction, but also they will have hydrogen bonds. So these molecules will have three intermolecular forces with them. Dispersion forces, dipole-dipole, and the hydrogen bond. A hydrogen bond is a sort of super dipole-dipole force. There are a few factors that uh, are involved in this hydrogen bond. A large electronegativ electronegativity difference between hydrogen and these electronegative elements as fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. Small size of these atoms allows neighboring molecules to get very close to each other, increasing that interaction of hydrogen bond. This will result in a strong attraction between the hydrogen in each of these molecules and the fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen of neighboring molecules. So this is an example here. We have the HF. The HF is a polar molecule and also has a polar bound. This is positive and negative. Okay. So this will be basically, uh, a, 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 we have the fluorine here, we have lone pairs around fluorine, and those lone pairs will attract the, the hydrogen, making this hydrogen bond, okay? If we overlap this over here, then we'll, we have the dipole-dipole interaction. But here, this is representing the hydrogen bond between those lone pair electrons of fluorine with a hydrogen from neighboring molecule. And this could be, this is, not, this is not only with molecules, with the same molecules. We could have, for example, HF and water, and this fluorine could attract a hydrogen from water, okay, making that hydrogen bond interaction. So we can have, we did, here we have the example of HF. So this hydrogen will interact with this lone pair of fluorine creating that hydrogen bond. This fluorine will have also, it has three lone pairs. One of them is going to interact with the hydrogen of another uh, HF molecule, inducing those hydrogen bond interactions. 
Here we have an example with methanol. Okay, since methanol contains hydrogen atoms directly bonded to oxygen, methanol molecules form hydrogen bonds to one another. So we are here we have the oxygen and the hydrogen. This is a polar bond. We have a dipole here, plus negative, partial, negative, partial, positive. And this partial positive will interact with the electrons of oxygen in methanol. Here we have two lone pairs on oxygen in this molecule. So one of them is going to attract this hydrogen from the oxygen. Now, the question is, can we create a bond between this oxygen and one of this hydrogen that are attached to carbon? What do you think? And the answer is no, we can't. Even though we have lone pair electrons here of oxygen that could be used to attract hydrogens, these hydrogens, they are in non-polar covalent bonds. So the only hydrogens that you could use to induce or to create those hydrogen bonds must be creating a bond with an atom that they can create a polar bound bond as, for example, the hydrogen and oxygen, okay, bond. So here we have this dipole, and this will be partial positive. That partial positive will help, uh, will induce to, these two electrons to attract, okay, so we can create here the hydrogen bond. The hydrogen atom on each methanol molecule is attracted to the oxygen atom of its neighbor, okay? And as well, do you think that this molecule can, in, can create hydrogen bond, for example, with water? And the answer is yes. For example, oxygen, the oxygen of water that has two electrons, two lone pairs of electrons, can attract this hydrogen. And as well, this oxygen of methanol could attract the hydrogen from water, creating that hydrogen bond between water and ethanol. And methanol, that's why they are miscible. Okay, so uh, water and methanol are miscible. You can mix those two liquids and you will have just one solution a um, homogeneous solution. Now let's see the effect of those hydrogen bond on molecules, okay, between, with, as I mentioned before, these two have the same molar mass, basically just a difference of two grams, but the, the most, the, the great difference between them is that this one is a non-polar molecule, while this one is a polar molecule and can create those hydrogen bond, okay? So let's see if that the presence of that hydrogen bond, do we have here dipole-dipole interactions? Between this carbon and oxygen, we have a dipole, and between this oxygen and carbon, we also have a dipole, so we will have dipole-dipole interaction also, as well as dispersion. So this molecule, we have dispersion, dipole-dipole, and hydrogen bond. So let's see if the presence of a hydrogen bond will have an, an effect on some physical properties as boiling point and melting point. And as we can see here, the difference is basically around 80 degrees, while in the last one that we saw just the difference between uh, the dipole-dipole and the dispersion was around 40, the presence of this hydrogen bond increased that difference to 80 degrees. And about the melting point is basically 90 or 80 degrees also. So this hydrogen bond can create stronger interaction between molecules, increasing or making the large difference between the physical properties of those that doesn't have those dipole dipoles or hydrogen bonds interaction. And as we mentioned before, we can use that, that, that the molar mass is basically the same. So the difference here because of this, or what we saw in the physical properties is due to the difference in the intermolecular forces. As larger, as, as larger those intermolecular forces, stronger, the difference on the physical property is gonna be large. So here we have water, and as I mentioned before, the water has dipole-dipole moment also, and also has a dipole uh, uh, polar bonds, okay? So this one is partial positive, partial negative. This partial positive will be attracted by the partial negative water, and specifically by the two uh, lone pairs. That's why they can create two hydrogen bonds here, because they have two lone pairs. From one lone pair, they can attract one hydrogen from one water molecule, while the, for the, with the other lone pair, they can attract another hydrogen from another water uh, molecule water. So water molecules form strong hydrogen bonds with one another. The boiling point of water is 100 degrees. 
remarkably high for a molecule with such a low molar mass of 18 grams. Okay, so and it's because of the presence of those hydrogen bonds between those molecules of water or water molecules. Now let's see another type of force that is known as the ion dipole forces. Ion dipole forces exist between sodium and the negative ends of water molecules and between the chlorine and the positive ends of water molecule. Sodium chloride is what? It's table salt. So if you add table salt to water, what is going to happen? It's going to dissolve. Okay, because we dissociate those ions, we separate those ions, the sodium and the chlorine, and the water molecule will surround those ions. Now remember that this is a cation, a positive ion. So that means that with water, they will interact with the negative, and the chlorine that is negative will interact with the positive. So that's why the range around the chlorine will be all the, the, uh, the partial positive ends or the hydrogens of what water molecules around the chlorine, while the sodium will be will be surrounded by the oxygen of the water because this is the partial negative part that will basically um, neutralize the positive charge of sodium as well here. Okay, so those positive charge of water, the partial positive charge will neutralize the chlorine and the arrangement will be just like this, while for the sodium will be the interaction of oxygen between the cation or, or the sodium ion. And this is an example of an ion dipole force. These are the ions and these are the dipole. Okay, this is the dipole. Remember that in water we have the partial positive and partial negative end. So this chlorine will interact with the partial positive and the sodium will interact with the partial negative end of the dipole in the water molecule. So here we have a table with all the different uh, intermolecular forces. The dispersion forces is really weak, and all atoms and molecule they they are they are in all atoms and molecule. Okay, so this is the if you have just one interaction intermolecular force is going to be the dispersion force that is weak. Also, we have the dipole dipole force that is a moderate strength, and this will be present just in molar molecules in polar molecules. Sorry, and the hydrogen bond. These are strong in, uh, intermolecular forces, and they will be present when we have hydrogen bonded directly to oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen, okay, that can create those hydrogen bonds. And the last one is the ion dipole. This interaction is really, really strong, okay, and it's a mixture between the ions of an ionic compound, the cation and the anion, with the um, end, polar ends of any polar molecule, okay, as we saw before the sodium chloride with the interaction with the water molecule. So these are the fours, uh, four intermolecular forces, different type of intermolecular forces. Now let's talk about chemistry and health. How can this hydrogen bond uh, is important in our health? So for example, hydrogen bonding in the DNA, a DNA molecule is composed of thousands of repeating units called nucleotides. Each nucleotide contains a base, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, abbreviated as A, T, C, and G. The order of these bases along DNA encode the instruction that specify how proteins are made in each cell of the body. DNA consists of two complementary strands wrapped around each other in the now famous double helix. Each strand is held to be to the other by hydrogen bond that occur between the bases on each strand. So this is the, the, the intermolecular force that help those strands to be together is the hydrogen bond. And we can think that the atoms that are involved in this must be hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, okay? Because fluoride is not present in the DNA, but you will, you will find oxygen, you will find nitrogen, and also hydrogen. So you now may think that if you are creating this hydrogen bond between these two strands of DNA, somehow those nucleotides, they have pres the presence of oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen that can create those hydrogen bonds. DNA replicates because each base, A, T, C, and G, has a complementary partner with which it hydrogen bonds. 
adenine hydrogen bonds with thymine and cytosine hydrogen bond with guanine always a with t and c with g that's the interaction between these nucleotides you will never well but for now a with t and c with g okay those are the interaction that we we're going to see in the dna the hydrogen bonds are so specific that each base will pair only with its complementary partner. When a cell is going to divide, the DNA unzip across the hydrogen bonds that run along its length. So the way that they separate is by breaking those, those hydrogen bonds between those nucleotides. The new bases complementary to the bases in each half add along each of the halves, forming hydrogen bonds with their complement. The result is two identical copies of the original DNA. So here we have just a, a general structure. This is in DNA. We have the phosphate, sugar, and the base. We have another nucleotide here. So this nucleotide and this one is really different okay, between them. But this is basically a structure, a general structure of the nucleotides in a DNA. And here we're going to see the double-stranded DNA. We can see here um, this one is the guanine. And this one is cytosine and cytosine and guanine. Here, thymine and adenine, adenine and thymine. The A and T and C and G, these are the only interaction okay, between them. So here we can see that we have here an oxygen with a carbon. This is a polar bond. Okay, This is a polar bond creating partial positive and a partial negative here. Here we have adenine, the, uh, the blue one is nitrogen, and this one is hydrogen. And this bond is a polar bond. Partial positive, partial negative. So that means that this partial positive hydrogen will interact with a lone pair of this oxygen creating a hydrogen bond. Here we have a nitrogen with three bonds and a lone pair of electron here. Here we have a nitrogen with a hydrogen that this bond is a polar bond also. So the two lone pairs from this nitrogen will interact with this positive hydrogen making or creating another hydrogen bond. And here in the bottom, we have a carbon and an oxygen. This is a polar bound, a polar bond, sorry. This is partial negative. It has two lone pair of electrons, that oxygen. And here we have nitrogen with hydrogen. This also is a polar bond, positive, partial positive, partial negative. This partial positive will interact with those electrons of guanine, of oxygen, to create that hydrogen bond. So between the C and the G, we're going to have three hydrogen bonds. Between T and A, we're going to have just two of them. Okay. So here we have a nitrogen-hydrogen polar bond. Nitrogen, two lone pair, a uh, lone pair. So that lone pair will interact with this hydrogen as well as this oxygen with this hydrogen. Okay. This and this is not a hydrogen bond. Why, is, why can't you create a hydrogen bond between this hydrogen and this oxygen? One reason is the distance is pretty long, okay? And another reason is that this hydrogen is not a part of a polar bond. So this hydrogen is not partial positive. This is not a part of a dipole, this hydrogen, okay? So that's why you can create a hydrogen bond here. But you will have between T and A or A and T, doesn't matter. You're going to have two, as we can see here, two hydrogen bonds. And between C and G, you're going to have three or three here, okay? So these are the hydrogen bonds that help to make close those two complementary strands of the DNA creating this helix that now we know as the DNA helix. Let's talk now about the types of crystalline solids, molecular, ionic, and atomic. Solids may be crystalline, a well-ordered array of atoms or molecules, or amorphous, having no long-range order. Crystalline solids can be divided into three categories molecular, ionic, and atomic, based on the individual units that compose the solid. Here we're going to have a representation of the three different types of crystalline solids, molecular, ionics, and atomic. The molecular solids are the composite units are molecules, and they will have low melting points. While the ionic solids, the composite units are formula units, cations, and anions. They are ionic solids, so they are formed by ionic compounds. And these ionic solids will have high melting points. And the third crystalline solids is the atomic solid, and the composite units are atoms. 
and the melting points are going to be variable for those atomic solids depending on the atoms that will form this solid. So let's talk about the molecular solids. Molecular solids are solids whose composite units are molecules, as we mentioned before. Ice, that is solid water, and dry ice, that is solid carbon dioxide, are example of molecular solids because these are molecules, water and carbon dioxide. Molecular solids are held together by intermolecular forces, dispersion forces, dipole-dipole forces, and hydrogen bonding. We can find any of these three um, intermolecular forces in the molecular solids. Ice is held together by hydrogen bonds, and dry ice is held together by dispersion forces. Because even though we have here, as we mentioned before, um, polar bonds, the molecule is nonpolar. So that means that the only uh, intermolecular force that it has CO2 is going to be dispersion forces. Molecular solids as a whole tend to have low to moderately low melting points. Ice melts at zero degrees and dry ice subl sublimates at minus 78 degrees Celsius. Ionic solids. They are solids composed of formula units, the smallest electrically neutral collection of cations and anions that compose the compound. Table salts, sodium chloride and calcium fluoride, CaF2, are a good example, examples of ionic solids. Ionic solids are held together by electrostatic attractions between the cation and anions. In sodium chloride, the attraction between the sodium cation and the chlorine anion holds the solid lattice together because the lattice is composed by, of alternating cations and anions in a three-dimensional array. Also, the forces that hold ionic solids together are actually ionic bonds. Since ionic bonds are much stronger than any of the intermolecular forces discussed previously, ionic solids tend to have much higher melting points than the molecular solids. Sodium chloride and an ionic uh, solid melts at 801 degrees Celsius, while carbon dis disulfide, a molecular solid with a higher molar mass, melts at 100, minus 110 degrees Celsius. And now the atomic solids. These are solids whose composite units are individual atoms. Diamond, carbon, iron, Fe, and solid xenon are good examples of atomic solids. Atomic solids can be divided into three categories. Covalent atomic solids, non-bonding atomic solids, and metallic atomic solids, each held together by a different kind of force. So these are the three different types of atomic solids. The covalent one, these are held together by covalent bonds and they have high melting points. The non-bonding atomic solids held together by dispersion forces, so you may expect it that they will have a low melting point because dispersion forces are the weakest of the intermolecular forces. And the metallic that will be held together by metallic bonds, and this also will, bear, will, will have variable melting points. So let's talk about the covalent atomic solids. This one as a diamond are held together by covalent bonds. In diamond, each carbon atom forms four covalent bonds to four other carbon atoms in a tetrahedral geometry. The structure extends throughout the entire crystal so that a diamond crystal can be thought of as a giant molecule held together by these covalent bonds. Since covalent, bo covalent bonds are very strong, covalent atomic solids have high melting points. Diamond is estimated to melt at about 3800 degrees Celsius. In diamond, carbon atoms form covalent bond in a three-dimensional hexagonal pattern. Here we can see each of these black spheres are carbon, and they have four bonds with other four carbons, uh, creating that tetrahedral um, 
geometry in each central uh, carbon, but also induced in a hexagonal pattern. As we can see here, this is a ring one, two, three, four, five, and six sides. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, and six sides. The that is a hexagonal pattern. Okay, in the diagram. So let's talk now about the non-bonding atomic solids. This, such as xenon, are held together by relatively weak dispersion forces. Xenon atoms have stable electron configuration and therefore do not form covalent bonds with each other. Consequently, solid, solid xenon, will other, like other non-bonding atomic solids, has a very low melting point, about minus 112, degrees Celsius. And finally, the metallic atomic solids. This one has iron or silver or lead have variable melting points. Metals are held together by metallic bonds that in the simplest model consist of positively charged ions in a sea of electrons. Metallic bonds are, uh, are of varying strength with some metals such as mercury have a melting point below room temperature, minus 39 degrees Celsius, and other metals, such as iron, having relatively high melting points, as iron that has an 1809 uh, degrees Celsius melting point. So here we have uh, a figure that represents that structure, the metallic atomic solid, all the cations here in that electron Z. In the simplest model of a metal, each atom donates one or more electron to an electron C. The metal consists of the metal cation in a neg negatively charged electron C, as we can see here. Let's talk now about water. Water is a remarkable molecule. If you think a little bit, you know that, for example, our body, 70% of our body is water, around 70% from 65 to 70%. As well, the world, the composition of, of the world, 70% of, wor of the world is also water. So it's, water is a really important molecule, a really important compound. Water has a low mass, molar mass of 18.02 grams per mole, yet it is a liquid instead of a gas at room temperature. Water's relatively high boiling point can be understood by examining the structure of the water molecule. As we can see here, we have the dipole-dipole in each bond of oxygen-hydrogen, and because of that, this hydrogen can create a hydrogen bond with the electrons of another oxygen of water. Okay, Thus, at the same time, this oxygen that has two lone pairs of electrons, each lone pair can attract uh, hydrogen from another molecule of water, of water, creating a network around this molecule of water of hydrogen bonds. And that's why the boiling point of water is really high for this low molar mass compound. So the bent geometry of water molecules and the highly polar nature of OH bonds results in a molecule with a significant dipole moment. Water's two OH bonds, hydrogen directly bonded to oxygen, allow water molecules to form strong hydrogen bonds with other molecules, or with other mo water molecules, resulting in a relatively high boiling point. Water's high polarity also allow it to dissolve many other polar and ionic compounds. Because remember, as we mentioned before, we have, for example, sodium salt. If, and we add the, that table salt to the water is going to be dissociated and the cation, that is the sodium, will be surrounded by the oxygen of water, creating a neutralization of all those oxygen that are partially negative all around that cation, as well with chlorine that will be an anion, will be surrounded by the delta positive region of the molecules of water that are the hydrogens. And that way, you're going to see a network of hydrogens around the chlorine ion. Consequently, water is the main solvent of living organisms, transporting nutrients and other important compounds throughout the body. 
Life is impossible without water. And in most places on earth where liquid water exists, life exists. Recent evidence of water on Mars that either existed in the past or exists in the present has few hopes of finding life or evidence of life there. Water is remarkable. The way water freezes is unique. Unlike other substances which contract upon freezing, water expands upon freezing. Because liquid water expands with it freezes, ice is less dense than liquid water. Water reaches its maximum density at 4 degrees Celsius. That's why the ice will float in water, because it's, it's less dense than the liquid water. Consequently, ice cubes and icebergs float. The frozen layer of ice at the surface of a winter lake insulates the water in the lake from for further freezing. If this ice layer were to sink, it could kill bottom-dwelling aquatic life and could allow the lake to froze or to freeze solid, eliminating virtually all aquatic aquatic life in the lake. So that's pretty cool in the nature, and and it's really wise, okay? Because if not, everything in the lake will die. The expansion of water upon freezing is one reason that most organisms do not survive freezing. When their water within a cell freezes, it expands it and therefore ruptures the cell, just as water freezing within a pipe bursts the pipe. Many foods, especially those with high water content, do not survive freezing very well either. Industrial flash freezing of fruits and vegetables happens so rapidly that the water molecules cannot align into the expanded phase and so the cells are not ruptured. Let's talk now a little bit about water pollution. Many human diseases are caused by poor water quality. Pollutants, including biological contaminants, can get into water supplies. Biological contaminants are microorganisms that cause diseases such as hepatitis, cholera, dysentery, and typhoid. Drinking water in developed nations is usually treated to kill those microorganisms. Most biological contaminants can be eliminated from untreated water by boiling. Water containing biological contaminants possess an immediate danger to human health and should not be consumed. Pollutants, including chemical contaminants, can get into water supplies. Chemical contaminants get into drinking water from sources such as industrial dumping, pesticides and fertilizer uses, and household dumping. These contaminants include organic compounds such as carbon tetrachloride and dioxin and inorganic elements and compounds such as mercury, lead, and nitrates. Since many chemical contaminants are neither volatile nor alive like biological contaminants, they are not eliminated through boiling. So let's do a small review here of the sections 12.6 to 12.8. The types of intermolecular forces, the dispersion forces, are occur between all molecules and atoms due to instantaneous fluctuations in the electron charge distribution or in the electron cloud. Dipole-dipole forces exist between molecules that are polar. And hydrogen bonding exists between molecules that have hydrogen bonded directly to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. Remember that hydrogens bonded to carbon, those hydrogens can't create hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are the strongest of the three intermolecular forces. Also, we talk about the types of crystalline solids, the molecular solids, the ionic solids, and the atomic solids. And also, we talk about water. Because this is strong hydrogen bonding, water is a liquid at room temperature. Unlike most liquids, water expands with when it frees. 
water is highly polar, making it a good solvent for many polar substances. And this will be the end of this model of chapter or sections of chapter 12.6 through 12.8, liquid solids and intermolecular forces.